Welcome to Transit Unplugged. I'm your host, Paul Comfort, and this is another edition of Transit Unplugged News and Views. That's the new title of our old Comfort's Corner show. And we changed it because we wanted it to more reflect actually what's happening, right? So this is a show that is in between our two long form shows, Transit Unplugged In Depth, which are in depth 30 minute interviews with transit executives from around the world. And then in between those, so we have a show every Wednesday, are the Transit Unplugged News and Views shows. And this will be just what we're going to do today as an example. We'll do a segment on news, then we'll do a newsmaker interview. Today it's with Andrew Bada, who is the, in charge of UITP for North America. It's a great interview. Alea Carey will be on with a wonderful message in minute, as she always does. And then we'll do a segment on the future of public transportation, where I talk about some of the trends I'm seeing happening in the industry, all packaged nicely for you in about a 30 minute show. So this is uh, really the first official episode of Transit Unplugged News and Views. Let's take a look at the news headlines. The United States House of Representatives passed the five-year, $715 billion Transportation Reauthorization Act. It's called the Invest in America Act. They passed it last week with a vote of 221 to 201. And you'll recall that the um, Reauthorization Act happens about every six years, but last year they did a one-year extension. This bill includes $343 billion to improve and repair roads, bridges, and transportation safety, plus $109 billion for transit, which is up significantly. This is the Authorization Act. Uh, The appropriations will come later. And $95 billion for passenger and freight rail. So this is um, big news. And uh, AFTA President and CEO Paul Scatella said that this bill makes critical investments to surface transportation including the $109 billion for public transportation and $100 billion for commuter rail, Amtrak, and other high-performance rail. It puts us on the path to increase access to opportunities for all Americans and build more equitable communities. And that is exactly what's happening now. Paul has nailed it on the head as usual. Great leader for our industry. Uh, That is really the hottest trends right now. And I'll talk about that later is that it is about using, using this moment in time where the COVID pandemic reduced our ridership, gave us a gut punch, you know, by 50%. And it really was an existential threat to transit, according to the New York Times article last July, where we could have entered a downward spiral. But instead, the national government and local governments and brilliant CEOs uh, of all uh, types of transit agencies, the large ones, the small ones, were brilliant in their response to this. They stepped up and did all kinds of things that transit agencies maybe don't normally do, like Meals on Wheels and other things, and providing access to communities that did not have internet, where they would drive the vehicle out there, a paratransit vehicle out there and park it, so it would, it would do Wi-Fi for that uh, apartment complex, whatever. I mean, we were doing whatever it took to help people uh, meet the needs of the moment, getting people to the vaccines, right? We had Mr. Vax Transit on recently, Stuart Mater, who talked about the 450 transit agencies in North America that really responded and helped people get to the vaccines. And other ones like Nat Ford's Jacksonville Transit actually took the vaccine to people. So we stepped up and did whatever needed to be done. And the government, I think, realized that public transportation is not just a local uh responsibility. It's a national priority. It really makes the wheels of our economy turn. Half the people, 50% ridership on most bus services during the middle of pandemic when only essential workers were allowed to ride. What's that tell you? That the essential work that's being done, you know, the water plant running, right? The pharmacy tech, the nurse at the hospital, these people ride public transit and it is a national priority. And this new funding level authorized takes that into account and it increases opportunities for all Americans. So this moment of an inflection point gave public transit agencies opportunity to reflect on what Simon Sinek calls the why. Why are we doing what we're doing? And it's more than just getting people from A to B or just getting commuters to work. No, it's about providing access to opportunities for all Americans and to make sure that we build equitable communities. Like Paul said, that's what it's about. We'll talk more about that later in the show. But great news coming out of Washington. Still has to pass the Senate. And remember, this is not the infrastructure bill. That's a whole separate bill that supposedly there's bipartisan agreement on, right? And that could be another potentially trillion dollars and much money for hopefully in the final bill, there'll be more for infrastructure, capital related expenses for public transit. But this is a good start. The other great news coming out of Washington was that the Federal Transit Administration announced approximately $182 million in funding 
for low and no emission buses and facilities that support them. The program helps contribute uh, to the goal of reducing greenhouse gases. The project selections were approved as part of what they call the low no program. You may have heard people talk about that and didn't know what that was. The lower no emission program funds the deployment of zero emission and low emission transit buses and supporting equipment and facilities. This latest grant of $182 million funds 49 projects in 46 states and territories. And um, it's great, uh, a great program. You know, all kinds of things are happening with it. Chicago Transit Authority will receive $7 million to purchase battery electric buses and charging equipment, upgrade at Southside Bus Depot and provide workforce training. The Port Authority of Allegheny County in Pittsburgh receives over $5 million to purchase electric chargers and make improvements at their garages to support future electric buses as part of their planned bus rapid transit system. On and on, lots of programs got some money, so that's really good news. Speaking of Chicago Transit Authority, they're kind of, um, I wanted to use them as a bellwether, to, a bellwether today to show how public transit ridership is increasing. Bus and ridership on the Chicago Transit Authority has more than doubled since the start of this year of 2021 and continues to grow. Since January, overall ridership has jumped 56% to 4 million rides a week. Rail ridership, which like in most cities, saw a sharper drop during the pandemic than bus ridership, was up 94% in mid-June compared to January with more than 1.6 million weekly trips. So rail and bus are seeing an increase. And our buddy Dorval Carter, who's CTA president, said there's no question that the CTA service needs to support the returns of all things we're used to, whether you're getting back to the office or enjoying one of Chicago's many summertime events, the CTA is ready when you're ready. And that's the that's their motto they're using. Great, great news. Another uh, trending story, which I wanted to give you because it kind of tells you what's happening in the industry, is microtransit. The Harris County Transit system, which is uh, Houston Metro in Houston, Texas, is beginning an inaugural on-demand transport service this week for residents living in Generation Park areas, precincts one, two, and four. It's an affordable service that allows residents to schedule transportation within two established zones, and the service provides a faster trip and enhanced passenger experience through areas of the county that are less densely developed. It's a $1 fare for adults and 50 cents for children, um, and um, so this is what's happening across the country. Microtransit, on-demand transit, mobility on demand is happening. A couple other notes of interest uh, on the personnel side. Hey, we want to welcome David Scorey. David has been promoted to president and CEO of Keolis North America, one of the large contractors and a member of the North American Transit Alliance. Scorey will oversee all of Keolis's operations in North America, which currently include the United States and Canada. He takes over the position from my good pal, Clement Michel, who was recently appointed Senior Executive Vice President of Human Resources and, Transfer and Transformation of Keolis Group, headquartered in Paris. Uh, Scorey has more than three decades of experience and uh, has recently been running um, their big operation in Boston. So congratulations to David. I look forward to working with him more in the months to come. And also our good friend, Gary Thomas, who was the head of DART in Dallas, the CEO there, uh, retired recently and has joined Jacobs, the big engineering firm, as the U.S. market transit leader. So he has joined them as the U.S. transit market leader. Thomas will leverage his rich industry experience, they say, to assist clients in developing and advancing transit programs, as well as identifying and attracting the best talent to, to Jacobs. So, you know, they say Gary, and this is true, Gary is a long, Ken Gilmartin, who's executive vice president, said, Gary's a longtime driver of new technologies. His experience will help us continue providing leading edge solutions. And you remember, he's the one that really, in my opinion, brought mobility as a service in a way to work that it was, you know, unlike many other cities. All on one app, I remember visiting down there two or three years ago with Gary and with David Leininger, who just stepped down as the acting CEO um, for the new CEO that's coming from LA. Uh, but they both worked really hard on improving the mobility as a service app. So congratulations uh, to Gary Thomas. We wish him well in his retirement. You know, we always like to keep track of former CEOs since I'm one myself and see where they're going in the industry. Hey, thanks for being with us today. As I mentioned, make sure to stay tuned for the entire podcast. Uh, we've got a great interview with the, uh, a good buddy of mine who is head of UITP, the International Transportation Union here in North America, Andrew Bada. And then we'll take a look at um, Alea Carey's messaging minute and then the future of public transportation. What are the hottest trends happening right now in the industry? Thanks for being with us today on this edition of Transit Unplugged News and Views. I'm Paul Comfort. We're excited to have with us today my good friend, Andrew Bada, who is regional manager for UITP, the International Transit Union for North America. 
Andrew, thanks for being with us today. Pleasure to be here, Paul. You know, always great to talk with you. So Andrew and I have worked together over the years on many projects. As a matter of fact, he was uh, with us when we celebrated our two-year anniversary for the podcast a couple years ago in Canada. It was a good night, wasn't it? It was really fantastic. And it was cold, but great. And Andrew runs for North America, really the world's largest transportation organization, which is UITP. Uh, Andrew, are you are you uh, in New York City now? Yes, I'm based in New York City, yes. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about UITP and your role there. Okay. Uh, well, as Paul said, UITP is a global nonprofit uh, association focusing on urban transit. And um, many of you don't realize that, but UITP was founded in 1885 in, in, in Belgium, where a lot of transit operators, starting with streetcars and urban rail, realized that there needs to be some kind of common platform for even simple things as uh, the size of the gauge of the track, so that when the trams were going for between cities, they would, wouldn't, they would continue smoothly. So it's a worldwide association, and now we have grown, and we are in um, over 100 countries. We have close to 2,000 members, and our association is divided into regions. We have 17 regions, and I manage the North America region, which includes um, the U.S. and Canada. And just recently, we opened up our brand new, the 17th regional office in Mexico, because we have a uh, South America region in Sao Paulo. We had my region, North America, but somehow Mexico uh, is neither North nor South and is big enough country to deserve its own regional office. So we have a brand new office right there. On the Latin American one, as you know, I was, uh, I've been able to, uh, I, I did like a five minute introduction to the recent conference that they had there, just uh, this last month in June. And uh, some of our guests coming up this month in July, both of our guests on the in-depth interviews are from Latin America, from Brazil. So we're excited to have the podcast enter into that market. And we hope to have some folks from Mexico and other places as well, as well as your new president of your organization. So his name is Khalid Alhogail. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. He is the, um, the new president of the International Association of Public Transport, UITP, and he's the chief executive officer and managing director of the Saudi Public Transport Company uh, and was elected as the new president for the 2021 through 2023 term. So that's kind of exciting to get a new leader. Yeah, I mean, actually, UITP has a very, very, very democratic process, and we elect almost everybody. The members elect uh, the people on top. We were fortunate to have uh, Per Cavett, who was the head of the Barcelona Regional Transport Authority. This is the regional trains in Barcelona, and he was fantastic for four years, but his term expired. And uh, we like to have presidents from different regions, and we never had one from the Middle East. And we have uh, Mr. Khalid uh, joining us, and he's uh, full of energy, enthusiastic, and um, uh, we, love, we love to have him. And that's a whole idea with uh, UITP is that we try to have as much of a global connectivity not just staff, but members uh, all over the world. The idea is to, to seek best practices, to learn from each other, and uh, make it easy for peer-to-peer contacts. So, for example, if you are a, a, a person in Baltimore and you want to talk to somebody directly from Milano, you know, you look up in the, uh, in the membership uh, uh, module and you can connect immediately. Yeah, that's pretty awesome about it. All the international best practices. I know I've been working with Michelle over in uh, Australia quite a bit. Um, she's the head of the organization there and uh, done some done some events over there and have another one coming up with UITP in Africa uh, and the Middle East uh, coming up really soon. They're co-sponsoring an event with us. So um, tell us about the differentiation here in North America. We have an organization called CUDA in Canada and APTA in America and the U.S., and how do you all interact with them? Actually, we have an excellent relationship with both. As you know, when we met in Calgary, there was a CUTA conference, and that was jointly sponsored by UITP. And this year, with APTA, we had our first international rail conference together with APTA. And we decided to join forces this year because, especially with the pandemic, uh, there was such a thirst for international experience and the heartaches and the problems and the lessons we learned that we thought, especially this year, it would be apropos to join with them. We have a good relationship with them. Both CUTA and APTA focus on members in their own countries. Okay, so 
Uh, AFTA is doing a great job with members in the US. Canada, Qatar does the same thing. Our role is to connect this region, Canada and US, to the international scene with our membership. So, so the three associations have their own specific focus, but we all know that we need to collaborate with each other. And matter of fact, uh, uh, when we have a, a, a policy board, we ask both APTA and the CUTA to uh, help us find candidates for our policy board. So we, we seek their recommendations how to uh, run our organization globally. That's excellent. You mentioned the pandemic, and that's one of the questions I wanted to ask you, because you're seeing the global effort, and and I get a lot of great information, by the way, from your organization, UITP, on global ridership numbers on a regular basis, and how uh, transit systems around the world are recovering from the pandemic. What would you say, where are we at right now in July of 2021 in the recovery efforts, and what are some of the trends you're seeing in the area of public transportation kind of coming back? Well, there is a lot of optimism around there, especially the vaccine. And there's also a lot of depressing news. Uh, for example, as you know, South America is not doing well. So for example, our, our colleagues in Argentina, their ridership is way, way, way below because uh, frankly, it's very, very much connected to the vaccine success. That's number one. Or how organized and concentrated the the lockdown and early action by governments were. So for example, in Taiwan or in China or in Singapore, which is a, they are all well-controlled societies, you know, whether it's, uh, you know, socialistic or whatever, you know, the well-controlled societies and early on they decide to take action. And those countries, those societies, the transit came back very fast. For example, back in, in Taiwan, it's almost like 100% back, you know, you're looking at Hong Kong, China, whatever doing great. Uh, if you look at the US and Europe, you know, actually making progress, it is coming back. I live in New York City. I mean, I was in a subway uh, yesterday, standing room only. Really? You know, absolutely. You know, this was weekend. Okay, standing room only. It's, uh, of course, not back to the 6 million. Right. But uh, I would say probably they are up to 60%, something like that. Mm -hmm. So there are general worldwide trends and there are some interesting, uh, unique things. Uh, one thing we found out that you can you can talk to an agency which is maybe not known uh, around the world, Dusseldorf or whatever, and they find out that gee, we use this specific sponge, you know, to clean a stanchion, you know, which we never heard about it. And suddenly people say, wow, that's great, you know. So uh, uh, the global trend is, um, which is proven, and this is URTP strong focus that contrary to popular belief, the, the virus did not and does not spread by touching something in a rail car or a bus. When you go to a pharmacy or a supermarket, you are just as crowded in the aisle shopping around as you, you know, sitting in a bus or going in a train. So that has been proven. But unfortunately, uh, a lot of governments, even the US CDC says, you can go anywhere without a mask except on a train. Right. Which is which we think, frankly, it's very very unfair um, uh, because there are many many other venues. I mean, you can go to a baseball game and uh, events and concerts and movies, no mask. So I think our challenge is to try to convince the authorities that uh, proclaim these things to ease up on that. Yes. Now you spent part of a long part of your career at the New York MTA, where you retired. Uh, after 27 years as Chief of Global Best Practices and Innovation. What a great title and what a great role to have as you spun out into UITP. Tell us a little bit about that and what you did there at the MTA. Well, you know, of course, the MTA, and by the way, I never had one boring day working there. It was a, <laughs> it's it's a amazing, you know, and it's not giving enough credit. You know, 70,000 people with many agencies within the MTA who are doing a hero. I call them heroes. It's a heroic job to hold up a company that has been running 24-7 since 1904, okay? Nothing else in the U.S. has been running 24-7 since 1904, okay? Except maybe Niagara Falls, okay? Yeah. <laughs> right? I always said that. So obviously a huge agency like that is conservative, you know, because they learned lessons, they, they tried something, didn't work, so very conservative. So my job, and I was reporting to the president, is to 
be an agent of change. Now, usually agents of change are, when I came to a meeting, they said, oh boy, he's coming again, you know, some uh, ideas, you know. But I looked at that as the challenge, okay? I'll give you an example. Worldwide, when you go on a subway, you can walk between cars smoothly, open gangways, right? MTA and almost all US agencies, okay, said, no, we don't do that, separate cars. So being global best practices person agency, I said, look, uh, guys, Let's have the open gangways on, on, the, on, the, on the subway. And look what's happening. They already they buy new rolling stock and they have two trains now to test that. So that was my job, to push new things. And sometimes I call myself uh, constructively annoying. <laughs> <laughs> Which is the job of a change agent, right? I mean, that was my job, you know, basically yeah. to go into a meeting and say, no, we, don't, we shouldn't do that. You know? And of course, yeah. they said, no, sit down, be quiet, etc. Et <laughs> but many things uh, came, came through um, so um, so I, I enjoyed it and it was it was a, a challenge and a struggle but I have to say uh, eventually most of the ideas percolated up and it takes a time it takes time right okay? for example fold up seats okay to create more room you know when I first mentioned it, they said oh my god what you what you creating a cattle car you know and then somebody said, wait a minute, you know, we have a lot of crowding here and maybe if you have some fold-up seats, not only it lets the wheelchair person have a more space, but it creates more space in the car. So et cetera, et cetera. So that was, yeah. that was my job. I enjoyed it. And, and because in the job, I was always seeking out uh, recommendations and knowledge from UITP. So that's how, that's a, that was the involvement of yeah. what I was doing. Well, what a great uh, what a great setup for my final question for you, which is: so you spent all these years in America's largest transit system, uh, coming up with fresh ideas for the future. So I want to ask you, Andrew, where do we go from here as an industry coming out of COVID? With you know, people are reevaluating commuter services and you know the the AM and PM peaks, and there's lots of change going on. Right, this was an inflection point in how we deliver service. So where do you think we go from here and what recommendations do you have for our industry? Well, uh, I have some of my very personal views. First of all, um, I think in the U.S. generally, the model is show me the people who want to use transit, then I'll provide you service, okay? I want to see that personal platform, then I might give you an extra train, okay? Generally, in Europe and worldwide, maybe not, maybe, maybe Asia and Europe, and the model is I'm going to give you as many trains as possible to entice you to come. So if you go in the subway in, a, in RATP in Paris, that train is keeps coming every two or three minutes, okay? They don't have to say, like, prove it to me that somebody's going to be there. So because of that, the public says, I don't even see, need the, the schedule. I go down, there's a train. In the U.S., because of the budget situation, you know, the CEO says, I will not send an extra train out until I I see the passengers prove it to me, like in the the Missouri, you know, show yeah, show yeah, me, sure right? Exactly. Yeah. exactly. So I think that's one way. I think in many ways, agencies could entice people to come back. Maybe run shorter trains more often. Okay. So so that's something I I, I see. I think what has happened, which is good, and maybe these people disagree with me, this flattening of the peaks in the morning and evening. I think is actually very cost effective because to service the peak of the peak by age for agencies is very expensive. Yes. Sometimes you need that extra two or three trains just to serve that 50 minute peak period. And of course you have to staff that train, et cetera. So I think with this idea about the peak is flat, I think economically for agencies, that could be a benefit. Yes. You know? Plus who know, who, plus the just... peak of the peak is horrible. You know, people hate that, right. you know? Right. Yeah, I've so, heard that from several people lately that this is actually a blessing. Yeah, yeah. I, think, I think so. So because, you know, I mean, again, in New York City, I remember like go to Grand Central Station at 8.46 a.m. was like the peak of the peak. And it was like, you know, it's just a nightmare, you know. Right. And, 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 to, and to service that, they had to have all these extra staff, marshalling people around, et cetera. So now I think those, those staff resources could be reallocated. So I think that's a good thing that's coming out of it. I also think that, People went back to cars and all that. But I do think and I believe and I hope that there will be a tipping point again and people say, wait a minute, why am I driving again? I mean, I used to be a transit customer and I chose transit before because it was faster, cheaper, better, more convenient. So that's why they went to transit originally. So now they're back in the car. 
So when they're stuck in traffic, some people are going to say, wait a minute now, why am I sitting in my car for 45 minutes without moving? I used to be a transit rider. Maybe I'll try it again. So I think and I hope that that tipping point is coming. Very good. Well, thank you. Those are great, great ideas. And I think that gives us a positive viewpoint headed into the future. Thank you, Paul. I mean, always enjoy talking to you because you're one of the uh, brightest. You're also an innovative type, you know, so I think we, we are similar birds, similar types, you know, so I enjoy talking to you. Thank you. Andrew Bada, UITP Regional Manager from North America, our Newsmaker interview on this week's Transit Unplugged News and Views. Hey, this is Tris. I'm here with Alia Carey, Alia Carey. And for hey. when she usually does the messaging minute here on Transit Unplugged News and Views. And I shared with you uh, 30 seconds of the interview that people just heard from Andrew Bada talking about getting people back onto transit, that we have an opportunity to do that. How yep. would you help transit agencies communicate that? You know, this is so interesting because I just had this conversation yesterday with a very close friend who was a manic public transit user from his suburban home into the downtown core. And um, I, he's got a shiny new car that he bought in 2020. And I asked him what it was going to take for him to get back on public transit. And um, his, his particular take on it was that he's got a kid who he needs to um, uh, drop off at a public transit station in order to get her to her school. And that he thought would be the moment for him when school started that he would start uh, using it because of the proximity of the station and the convenience of the station. So that's one thing to bear in mind um, is like, how convenient are we making the system for people? Uh, so with that in mind, another way to, or other ways to think about how to communicate this, um, you know, Tris, you and I have talked before and we've talked about things like gas prices and people sitting in traffic. And if I, if I got to control the transit marketing universe for better or for worse, I think that um, one of the things I would do would be to plaster all of my available services, uh, if I were an agency, with messaging about um, really relevant, timely, immediate messaging about things like gas prices and the expense of, um, uh, of parking, which is uh, certainly relevant in the Bay Area. And um, challenges like sitting in transit, you know, I mean, so, sorry, sitting in traffic. Do you really want to be sitting in traffic when you could be sitting in transit? And um, the conversion that we're looking for in this model is around uh, both, as you, as you mentioned and was mentioned in the interview, getting people who used to use transit back on transit. And um, there's also an audience in there that is people who have never used transit before or who are very, very intermittent or light transit users and getting them onto transit and reminding them what the spectacular option is. You know, it's been 16 months um, of very, very light transit use. And as Paul likes to say, the gut punch to rider ridership in the industry. And um, the, so we have a lot of people to bring back and a lot of opportunity to bring people back. And those people, you know, they're not looking at your social media if you're an agency. They're not looking at um, uh, your newsletter. They haven't signed up for your newsletter. They're probably not visiting your website. They're not looking at your apps. So uh, I think the communications mechanism is uh, paid outdoor would be huge. Mm -hmm. And the... Um, the, what I like to think of as uh, paid outdoor for the ears, which is radio. Absolutely. Well, Elia, it was it was fantastic to have this chat with you. I always want to ask you more questions when you have your segment. So now I finally get the chance. And uh, we'll hear from you next month in your messaging minute. We'll be closer to back to school. Let's see what uh, what what your next tip for transit agencies is. Yes, thanks for the time. And now back to Paul for his segment on the future of public transit. Thanks for sticking with us today on the podcast, Transit Unplugged News and Views, the world's number one leading transit executive podcast. There's a lot happening in the public transportation industry, even though we're in the middle of what normally would be considered, you know, the summer doldrums. But what's happening right now is drivers. We need drivers. You know what happened, right? So basically, by what I could tell, this is my view, uh, is that 
During the pandemic, many and most transit agencies stopped their recruiting and their driver classes. You know, it takes about 10 weeks uh, for most transit agencies to train a new driver to, you know, get their CDL. Most folks don't come in with a commercial driver's license and then train them on, you know, how to drive the vehicle and the routes and all that kind of stuff. It's a long process. A lot of investment into a public transportation operator is what they're called in most transit agencies for the larger buses. And um, so they stopped recruiting. And, you know, there was multiple reasons behind that, right? We weren't meeting in person for a while. And also the number of routes that were on the road were dropped dramatically. Uh, most routes, most systems dropped their routes in half. They went to Saturday only schedules, et cetera, because ridership was cut. So as a result of that, you know, the um, they continued to have natural attrition, right? People retiring, people uh, deciding to not work as drivers anymore. A lot of them, a lot of folks were getting, uh, you know, the double un unemployment from their state and federal government while making maybe $900 a week uh, on unemployment. So now that we are back into seeing the kind of ridership increases that we just talked about at the beginning of the show, right? Across the country, ridership is ticking up, especially in bus, but even in rail, as we talked about at Chicago Transit Authority and other places, you know, New York going to 24-7 Metro service again. Now everyone is clamoring for drivers, whether it's freight trucks, delivery vans, ride hails, public transit, even school bus transit. These drivers are in high demand these days as the economy recovers from COVID and now shifts into overdrive. You just look at LinkedIn or Simply Hired or any of these websites and you can see hundreds and hundreds of job listings in major cities around the country. Patrice McElroy, who is the head of human capital and development at the Los Angeles County Metropolitan Transit Authority, said it's very difficult to find drivers. She said they're looking to hire 800 bus operators between now and the end of summer as it begins to ramp up service that had been cut during the pandemic. Metro is dangling, you know, the DMV licensing reimbursements as a lure for a job that starts there at only $16.90 an hour. But competition is steep for drivers. Uh, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce President Suzanne Clark said last week the worker shortage is real. Uh, and they've just released a study saying we're quantifying the nation's workforce crisis. Three quarters of the country's businesses reported it was either difficult or very difficult to hire workers right now. And that includes the ride hailing companies like Uber and Lyft both of which are actively recruiting new drivers to their platforms as the economy rebounds and trip requests surge. Due to high demand, ride hail trip costs were up 37% in March and 40% in April, according to recent research done by Rakuten Intelligence, according to an article uh, that I pulled some information out of about this. So because more app use by riders necessitates more drivers to get them around, some uh, Uber places are offering temporary earning boost to drivers. Uh, Lyft is doing the same thing. During its May 4th earnings call, Lyft said it was focused on increasing the number of drivers on its platform to help meet rider demand. And the number or of drivers going through onboarding process had increased by more than 25% since the beginning part of the year. But a lot of workers are still sitting on the sidelines. Uh, some folks, uh, you know, don't trust companies. They feel like they're going to lure them in and then you know, not give them the, the long-term wages that they want. Plus the fact, as I mentioned, in a lot of the country still, there is this double unemployment coming out where folks can make between $600 and $900 a week to not work. Uh, and so a lot, some states have even pulled out the federal, um, my own home state, the governor said, we're not going to pay the federal um, unemployment portion anymore to get people back to work. But then there's lawsuits. And right now, as of uh, the time I'm recording this, uh, the Maryland Court of Appeals, our highest court, had said, no, 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 temporary restraining order is upheld. You have to keep paying the federal money out on unemployment. So but but um, so what's happening is a lot of transit agencies are trying to find new ways to attract drivers. Right. So they're offering you know generous um, uh, hiring bonuses. They're offering their existing employees referral bonuses. Uh, and, but many agencies, I just talked with another CEO this morning of a transit agency in the middle of America who said that, you know, they're looking at everything they can uh, to help drivers uh, get on board. And uh, some agencies now are on the paratransit side looking at bringing in these, what they call adaptive TNCs, companies like Silverride or Userve. These are companies that are like Uber and Lyft, but they're adaptive in the sense that they train their drivers on how to handle elderly and disabled passengers, uh, passengers with disabilities. And they also are uh, background checked and drug tested, unlike uh, the other normal TNCs, so that they meet the criteria required by FTA for a driver. And yet they're, they're following the model where they let a person drive their own vehicle. So they're able to come in at a lower cost. And you know, I was talking to somebody uh, earlier this week who's involved in that industry, and they said, really, you're just attracting 
a different type of driver, someone who can, you know, doesn't have to drive into the garage, drive a half hour, 45 minutes in, then go in and sign in, get the manifest, go out and find the vehicle, drive all day, you know, an eight hour, 10 hour shift, and then go back to the garage and then drive home. That attracts one type of driver, whereas a TNC is more like a gig employee, right? So they're coming out of their house, picking which runs they want to do that day. Maybe they only want to work three hours. They just hop in their car and there may be a trip within 10 minutes to pick up at their house. They can pick that up in their in their morning and still have their afternoon. So the type of drivers that are attracted by the gig economy, these adaptive TNCs, are a different type of driver. And um, they're finding great success is what I'm hearing across the country. I was, uh, I've, I've talked to maybe six different people over the last week about these adaptive TNCs. It really is the hottest trend. And bigger companies like First Transit and National Express, others, MV, they are looking to, TransDev, they're looking to these adaptive TNCs to actually become subcontractors to them uh, to help bolster their need for drivers as well. And some transit agencies are hiring them directly as well. So that's a hot trend right now is adaptive TNCs. We'll see how that develops over the summer. And then, of course, the microtransit, the equity inclusion, and the green buses we talked about at the beginning of the show. The other big one is rebooting of routes and integrated transit networks. I've talked around the world about this, just had a conversation with a leader in Sydney, Australia this week about moving to an integrated transportation network coming out of COVID. So many transit agencies still are what I would call disintegrated, meaning they run their light rail system or their tram system separate from their heavy rail system with separate management structures, separate KPIs, separate maintenance teams, separate uh, quality assurance teams. Uh, and then and that's all separate from their buses. And that runs separately from their commuter trains or commuter buses. That runs separately from their paratransit or from their you know, bikes and, and uh, adaptive mobility devices and scooters. So they're running all these separate silos like I used to have in Baltimore when I got there. And I said, no, we got to break this down. We got to link all this. So we created a program called Baltimore Link that linked up the bus routes with the existing subway, light rail, commuter bus and commuter train routes. So they all connected up together. And that integrated network then can provide a better transportation experience because it provides a, a wider service zone it provides the connections that are necessary to get places. And then if you layer on top of that, the micro transit safety net so that no one is left behind, you've really got a tremendous way to come out of COVID with a full package, a full complement of services. Um, and I'll be, you know, I'm, I'm visiting uh, TARC, the Transit Authority of River City, and we'll be talking about that, about how that this micro transit and how the integrated network really can work. And you can right size your heavy bus service and then layer in a micro transit service on top of that. Um, and that also attracts different types of drivers that don't need commercial driver's licenses, right? So you can train them quicker and get them on the street quicker, or you can hire contractors to help do some of that. And most of the contractors, you know, that we talk about are all unionized. So we're not talking about non-union jobs. We're talking about big companies, Keolis, National Express, RATP Dev, these companies that have relationships with the unions. But these are what some agencies are looking at as a way to come out of COVID. And that's what I see, my personal views on the trends that are affecting and shaping us as we come hopefully out of the COVID pandemic, definitely here in the United States and other countries are creeping toward it as well as they hit their higher vaccination rates, et cetera. Let me know what you think. If you disagree or if you agree, I'd be interested in your take on it. Shoot me an email, paul.comfort at trapezegroup.com or link up with me on LinkedIn where I put up something almost every day about the public transportation industry. Thanks for being with us and making us number one in the world on Transit Unplugged. I'm Paul Comfort. Stay safe out there.